Praise Jesus. Welcome to the final day of Spirit City Conference. Hallelujah. How many are ready for a visitation today? Hallelujah. As you have expected, the Lord will meet you. Because of time, let's just go straight to the word for today. The subject today is clarity on the subject of tongues. Clarity on the subject of tongues. Hallelujah. I know many people have either been asked, why do you speak in tongues? We don't understand what you are saying. And so today I just want us to look at the clarity on this matter and put it to sleep in Jesus' name. We look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 4. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. From verse 1. Let me just get the verses right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 7 to verse 32. First Corinthians chapter 14, from verse 7 to verse 32. I will read. It says, and even things without life-giving sound. For the sake of context, let's start from verse 1. I'll read quickly. There are many verses there. It says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it. In the spirit he speaketh mysteries, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that she prophesied, for greater is he that prophesied, for greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, I, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And even things without living life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise you accept you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian to me. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that he may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, by my, but my understanding is unfruitful. Verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will speak, I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupied the room of the unlearned say amen? At thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than all, more than ye all. 
Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice, I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto these people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by cause, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace, for ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. May God give us understanding in Jesus' name. So the foundation of our understanding today is the distinction within tongues is that we have what we, we call two types of tongues, two types of tongues. The first one, the tongues of men, where you speak a known language. You can be filled with the spirit and you start speaking French and you don't know French. Hallelujah. We went to a mission and when we were imparting the people, a woman started speaking in English and she had never spoken in English. She was illiterate. So tongues of men was in Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit came upon the people in the upper room, they started speaking. And the people that were around there from different nations were able to understand what they were saying. And they knew that those were Galileans. They knew that those people do not know those languages naturally. Hallelujah. There's a time... We were in Ebony, and Sada was speaking in tongues, and I could tell they were Congolese tongues. Are we together? So somebody of that language can actually understand what you are saying, and they'll surprise you. They'll ask you, do you know that you're speaking our language? Then number two, we have tongues of angels, which is in... 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, that says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So tongues of angels are the tongues that are mysterious. The language of the spirit. The language of the spirit. That is what we call tongues of angels. The second foundation of our understanding today is the function of the purposes of tongues. Tongues do not, do not serve the same purposes all the time. So the first purpose that we saw in Acts chapter 2 was prophecy. Tongues, speaking in tongues, I'll be using speaking in tongues to mean prophecy, is for men. The audience 
for prophecy is men. So somebody could be speaking in tongues, and if an interpretation is found, it is men that are being addressed. God is speaking to men through those tongues. The second purpose of tongues is prayer. I'll be saying praying in tongues to distinguish it with speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues, I'll be saying it is prophecy and praying in tongues, I'll be saying is prayer. So tongues are a prayer language, a language of intimacy with God, speaking mysteries to God. So here the audience is God, hallelujah. When, when we are prophesying, the audience is men. When we are praying, the audience is God. So, let me not defend it now. Let's just continue verse by verse. In verse 2, the Bible says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. In verse 2, we are talking about prayer in tongues. So when somebody is praying in tongues, the recipient is God and it is not man. So a man cannot say, I want to understand what you are saying. Why are you coding your language? I can't understand. The answer is, it is God that I'm praying to. You don't have to understand what I am saying. Hallelujah. So the Bible says that, Men, for no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. So, prayer language, most of the time, prayer language, it can be interpreted, but most of the time, it is not understood by men. Hallelujah. And so, when something is not being understood by men, but it is being understood by God, sometimes even you, you don't understand it. Is because there's a secrecy you have entered with God. There's an intimacy that you have entered with God that is not inviting of any other person. Hallelujah. Number two. The Bible says in verse three, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Verse 4 says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Verse 5 says, I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So these verses are introducing the dimension of tongues that are prophetic, that are prophetic words. Verse 2 was talking about speaking mysteries to God that was prayer. Verse 3 to verse 5 is talking about prophecy. So prophecy can be divided into two. Number one, prophecy can be given in plain language, in common language. The common language here is English and Swahili. So if God is speaking, a prophet can speak in English and all of us understand or speak in Swahili and all of us understand. Number two, prophecy can be done in tongues and then interpreted. So somebody can start speaking in tongues and another person interprets and we realize that God is using those tongues to speak to us. Hallelujah. So the demand of interpretation comes in when the tongues are prophecies. Hallelujah. When the tongues are prayer, it's intimacy. We don't need to know what you are conversing with God about. But if this person is prophesying in tongues for our edification, they have to be interpreted. Hallelujah. So at the end of the day, if somebody is prophesying in tongues, we have to be edified, exhorted, and comforted. Edified, exhorted, and comforted. 
to be edified is to be strengthened in our spirit. To be exhorted is to be reminded the things that we know. To be comforted is to be consoled in the reality of God. That's the purpose of prophecy. Hallelujah. When a person is speaking in tongues and they are praying, I hope by now we have known the difference between praying and prophesying, right? When a person is speaking in tongues and they are praying, the Bible says that they edify themselves. We cannot expect them to edify us when they are praying in tongues. Because somebody would say, if you pray in a way that I understand, maybe I can be blessed. But that is not the purpose of praying in tongues. The purpose of praying in tongues is personal edification. The purpose of interpretation of tongues in the time of prophecy is now for all of us to be edified. So if somebody stands here in front and says, thus says the Lord, and then they speak in tongues, they speak in tongues, they speak in tongues, and then they say, Amen. And nobody comes to interpret. Then that is the error. But if I am here and I am praying to God in tongues, it is not for your edification. Hallelujah. Next, verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. So instead of somebody preaching in tongues without interpretation, common language is used when we are doing sermons. Common language is used when we are passing across revelation. Common language is used when we are passing across doctrine. Because no matter how loaded our content is in the spirit, you cannot understand it unless we give you the language of your soul. Hallelujah. Your spirit knows all things, but your soul does not know the things that your spirit knows. Are we together? Your spirit was birthed by the Holy Spirit. It knows God. Your spirit knows things in God, but those things have not come to your mind. Those things have not come to your emotive realm. Those things have not come to your will. So it will take somebody to preach to your mind what your spirit already knows. So that if the preaching is true, you will have a witness in your spirit. Your spirit will say, yeah, that is true. Oh yeah, that is what I have always known. It is just that I never had the words to attach the experience I have had with God. Hallelujah. So yesterday dad was talking about the word. The word is not spiritual per se. The word is solical. The word is coming to help your soul understand the things of the spirit. The word is coming to help your mind understand what you felt in prayer, what you felt about sin, the conviction in your heart that did not have words. That's what revelation comes to give. Hallelujah. And if you know it is a deception, you may not have heard it. You may not have done research on it, but your spirit can tell you there's something wrong. There's something wrong. So your spirit knows things. It is just that it has not come to the language of the soul. So when we speak to people, we speak to the things that they already know. It is just that their soul was still catching up with what their spirit already knows. Hallelujah. So the speaking in church, like in a congregation like this, we will have to use a language of the soul. English is a language of the soul. It is not a spiritual language. Hallelujah. You, whether you are born again or not, you will learn English. Whether you are born again or not, you will learn Swahili. So that is a, a solical language. But we use solical languages to 
bring context to context and understanding to spiritual language. So when I come here, I am ministering to your soul and your spirit. I am not just ministering to your spirit. Hallelujah. I'm not just ministering to your spirit, so I have to speak in a language of men so that men can understand what I am saying. If I just come from beginning to end and I speak in tongues and I say, spiritual people must understand what I'm saying because we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Are you not deep enough to interpret what I am saying? The Bible calls that malice. Hallelujah. So in a congregational setting, we speak a solical language. If it is a spiritual language, we will speak. We will have to get somebody to interpret it in a spiritual, in a solical way. Let's continue verse by verse. We are in verse 7. The Bible says, And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, Except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise, ye except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. Tell your neighbor the ministry of sound. In the Old Testament, how they used to speak in tongues is by blowing trumpets. That is the prophetic interpretation of tongues in the Old Testament. That is the symbology of tongues. Hallelujah. Anywhere you see a harp being played, pictures being broken, sound being released, it was a telltale sign of tongues. So a tongue is not just the utterance that is being uttered. It is the sound that is coming from it. And different sounds, and I'm talking to people who are going to interpret tongues, hallelujah, that you must interpret the sound of the tongue. How I interpret tongues as a person, because God has given me that grace, is that I feel the sound first before I hear the interpretation. So the sound can be a sound of anguish. One time we had watched a documentary with dad on Boko Haram in northern Nigeria, and how they are massacring people in front of children. And then later on, we started praying. When we started praying, I'm hearing the anguish in my husband's spirit. I'm like, ah, these tongues. According to a normal person, his tongues are just normal. But in my spirit, I'm feeling the sound of anguish. I'm feeling the sound of travail. And then you graduate from there. When I graduated from that feeling is when now I heard him interceding or praying against Boko Haram. Hallelujah. So I started hearing Boko Haram in his tongues. Lord, what kind of demonic manifestation is this? But it came after I felt the sound. Hallelujah. There was a time certain ladies came, they were sisters. And I'm hearing their sound. I'm hearing their tongues. And the sound I'm hearing first is that these people are contending. They are quarreling in tongues. That's the first thing I'm hearing. I'm hearing a quarrel. I'm not hearing the distinct words because the sound is what will catch your attention for you to, to interpret. Hallelujah. One time Pasi was praying here. I didn't tell him. Everybody is praying in tongues, but sound is what tells me this one is the one to interpret. So when my attention was drawn to him, I had undefeated God, undefeated God in his tongues. Hallelujah. 
So you must master how God picks your attention and he will use sound. So there are sounds that speak of different things. There are sounds that say, this is battle. You will feel the sound of battle and you will know this person is spiritual warfare. Hallelujah. Some of us, you'll hear the sound of worship. And then when you come closer, you will hear the content of worship in their tongues. Tell your neighbor sound. So the Bible says, whoever prays in tongues must pray that he interprets the tongues. That means it is a grace that all of us should have if all of us are praying in tongues. So you must ask God, give me the essence of these tongues. What is the feeling? What is the emotion? Dad yesterday was talking about the heart versus the mind. If you want to interpret tongues, it is not about the mind or intellect. It is about what you feel in the sound. What mood is that tongue creating? Hallelujah. For those of us who are in drama, we used to have what we call soundtracks. So if a scene is sad, we are going to use a very, those Nigerian songs for sadness, you know them. If it is tension, we use ten sound. Hallelujah. So that it can bring your attention to the scene of that movie, the same as tongues. The spiritual realm is like a movie. Hallelujah. So the sound of a person will tell you the mood around what they are engaging. And then you will use that mood to open up the content of their tongues. Hallelujah. So, the Bible says, a trumpet, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So, if tongues are not interpreted, especially tongues that are supposed to marshal people to a certain work in God, then that is an uncertain sound. Nobody is profiting. Let's move to verse 10. And verse 11, the Bible says, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. He that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Tell your neighbor there are diverse tongues in the world other than the tongues that we have in God that are diverse, that are numerous, that are many, the world also has its own tongues. Hallelujah. Witches have their own tongues. Secular musicians have their own tongues in the chants that they do in their songs. Soccer teams have their own tongues. They chant. While you are celebrating your basketball team, you said things you don't know what they were. Hallelujah. And so, if in church you are not able to understand what tongues are, the tongues of the world will deceive you. Hallelujah. The sound of the world will deceive those that have not trained themselves to distinguish the sounds that are in God. You must discern sound in church. You must discern tongues in church. You must discern tongues in your fellowship. If you don't discern tongues in your fellowship, in Amatatu you will dance to the tongues of the world. Verse 11 says, If I know not the meaning of the voice, shall I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. He that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Tell your neighbor I'm not a barbarian. Something about the world is that they will code satanism. 
the grace that God has given me, humbly so, is the grace of interpretation of tongues in church. But I can in, interpret the things of the world. For instance, if I see a billboard, a secular billboard or another religious billboard, many times I see it and God draws me to a word and it could be the word of another language. And he tells me this is what they mean. This is the meaning of this word. One time there was a Hagarin school that he was telling me about. And I didn't see that school. And so I've been doing prayer walks in that place. So when I saw it one day, instead of that Hagarin word, I saw suicide. And I started saying nobody would have cracked this except by interpretation. One time I saw, we call them the house of ivory. How many know the house of ivory? They are the ones that have red marks here. Hallelujah. And they have a temple somewhere in Yangara. And there was a billboard there that was written in, I think, Gujarati or whatever language it was. And when I opened my eyes in the spirit, I saw that they were blaspheming God, words that I cannot even mention on this pulpit. So if you can't judge tongues here, you will not understand the satanism that is in the world. Because it is in innocent words, it could be just, I love you. But if you open your words in the spirit, you can interpret the blasphemy that that I love you is talking about. So if you are a barbarian, you will not understand what the world is plotting against children, what the world is plotting against Christianity. You must be a Greek. You must be a scholar in interpretation. You must be somebody who is asking, what is the meaning behind this new advert that has taken the world by storm? What is the interpretation behind this hairstyle, behind this fashion sense? And that starts with the interpretation of tongues. If you can interpret your own tongues, if you can interpret the tongues of your friends, you will understand the demonic agenda in the world. Hallelujah. Verse 12. The Bible says, Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Verse 13. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So I know we like asking God to bring interpreters from outside to interpret our own tongues. But the Bible says that him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Hallelujah. Let's just continue because of time. The Bible says, for I, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit pray, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So he's talking about praying in tongues. So when you pray in tongues, the Bible says it is your spirit that pray, but your understanding is unfruitful. So you can be there for six hours. Your spirit is engaging God. Your spirit is speaking mysteries to God. In fact, you are building up your stature in Christ. The people who speak in tongues truthfully are people who are very strong in the spirit. Hallelujah. And then the mind is unfruitful. And he gives us a solution for this unfruitfulness of mind. That he prays in spirit and then he prays in understanding. He sings in spirit and then he sings in understanding. This is what I want to encourage us. If we want to interpret tongues. Is when you are praying interchange. Flow and interchange. Pray in tongues, pray in English. Pray in tongues, pray in Kikuyu. Pray in tongues, pray in Swahili. Interchange as much as you can. 
Of course, there are times the Spirit will just want you to speak in tongues throughout. But with his help at the end or at the beginning or in the middle, you can try to interchange. When you interchange, you are not even thinking of what you're saying. You are just praying. Because prayer is a flow, you don't overthink the words you tell God. So when you pray like that, you'll be able to hear the words that you're speaking that are being inspired of God. And those words that you're speaking that are being inspired of God are not far from the tongues that you have been speaking. So that is the beginning of interpretation, that I just have a burden to say this word or to pray this verse or to intercede for this person as I interchange with tongues, as I interchange with tongues. You can know what the tongues are saying when you flow in understanding after you've spoken in tongues. Hallelujah. So, exercise interpretation. You'll be very edified the more if you know what you have been telling God. If you know what you have been praying. If you know the things that have been coded. There are some God will never tell you because the Bible says that the hidden things belong to him. The revealed things belong to us and our children. So the hidden things we may not know today. God might be protecting you from your own prayers. Hallelujah. Maybe in tongues you are saying, God, if there's anything in my life that is not bringing you glory, remove it. Don't have mercy on me. Even if I cry, just remove. Those are prayers you'd never pray. You understand? And then when God begins to remove those things, you start asking yourself, when did I pray this prayer? I don't remember. Pray this prayer. So God knows us more than we know ourselves. So for him to cause us to pray his will, because he knows there are some things we cannot pray. We'll pray them in tongues. The Spirit will, will inspire our tongue. That day we will burst and we'll say, today God has graced me in prayer. Let me tell you, my sister, I've not prayed for long, but today I went on and I went on. Ah. Hallelujah. So interchange as much as you can. But if the Spirit is not giving you the utterance of understanding or the utterance of a common language. Just know something is happening. Eh? Just accept the will of God. Pray in tongues and God will be faithful to you. Verse 16 says, Else when thou bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupied the room of the unlearned say amen? At thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. Somebody was asking me, if somebody is praying for me and they are speaking in tongues, should I say amen? Hallelujah. And we, we are urging ministers and pastors, interchange, let the person hear what you are praying for them about so that they can say, Amen. Hoshe ona tumtu ana kuwambia in tongues. Mi na zaogop. Hey, somebody is on the street. He's telling you, can I pray for you? And you say, by the way, God, I've been asking for you to send me somebody to pray for me. Ananza. Ah. Hallelujah. Especially, the Bible is not saying that you should not pray pray in tongues for somebody, but he's saying for the unlearned and for the non-believer. For the unlearned is somebody who does not understand the language of the spirit, does not understand the doctrine of tongues. Here I can pray for you in tongues and you will be okay. You understand? But an unbeliever or somebody who has not understood what tongues are, I cannot just pray in tongues for them or speak over their lives or bless them, which is the prophetic praying in tongues. Blessing. I cannot bless them in tongues without interchanging with understanding. Hallelujah. We need to finish. 
Verse 17, for thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. This is if people are within the context of your prayer and they want to understand what you're praying. You understand, for instance, if you call new believers in a discipleship class and you tell them, let us pray. I want to pray for you. I want to bless you. If they are unlearned and they are not born again, you cannot give in thanks in tongues only. You've understood that concept? But if we are learned people, if we are believing people, we understand what tongues are. It is not a problem when you are praying and blessing in tongues. Verse 19, the Bible says, Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that, my voice, that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding, how be it in malice, be ye children, but in understanding be men. So he's saying when he wants to teach the church, he'd rather speak five words in a known tongue than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So the teaching ministry, you cannot teach in tongues unless you interpret. Verse 21, the Bible says, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto these people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Verse 22 says, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Isaiah 28, verse 11 and verse 12 was the prophetic anticipation of tongues. When the Israelites had refused to hear the word of God from Hebrew prophets, the Bible says, now that you have refused to hear from people that are speaking your own language, I am going to judge you and I'm going to send people of a different language to judge you, to teach you a lesson. So in tongues, the Bible says that it is a sign, not for believers, but for non-believers. That when a non-believer hears a tongue, a tongue that he or she does not understand, they know that they are being judged. Hallelujah. That we have been speaking to non-believers in a tongue that they know. On the streets, preachers have been preaching in English. On Facebook, they have been preaching in a language that they understand. But in the day of judgment, an unbeliever will begin to hear a language that they do not understand. The judgment for an unbeliever or the sign, when an unbeliever hears tongues, he's supposed to say, why can't I understand? And you say it is the word of God. And your response is, the word of God has been said before in a language that you have understood and you did not hearken. Now it is time for you to hear it in a language that you do not understand. The Lord sent the Assyrians to speak a language that the people did not understand as a judgment to them. Tell your neighbor a language that you do not understand is judgment. The Bible says that prophecy is for believers because they have believed. So if you can understand, you are not in judgment. If you cannot understand, you are in judgment. So if a prophecy comes and people understand, it is for the benefit of believers. They have believed God and God will continue speaking to them in a language that they understand. But if prophecy, I mean, if People come here, they are non-believers, and they hear people speaking in tongues, and they feel like they are being isolated. They are being segregated. It is a sign of the judgment of God. Let's continue, verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Verse 24 says, But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged 
of all. So why do they come in and say that you people are mad? All of you are speaking in tongues. You people are mad. Is number one, when people are prophesying in tongues and there is no interpretation. Hallelujah. So everybody comes to the front and say, thus said the Lord, they speak in tongues, they say amen, they sit down. The next person speaks in tongues like that, they sit down. Because in the early church, everybody used to contribute something. That is why at the end, Paul says, somebody should come with a doctrine, a revelation, a tongue, and a psalm. That's how they used to fellowship in their house fellowships. Hallelujah. So the early church was a house fellowship. It was not a congregational practice as much as today. So when they used to sit in their homes, somebody was supposed to share what they have learned from God. Somebody could share a song. Somebody could share a doctrine. Somebody could share an interpretation. But before that, before Paul brought that order, everybody was sharing in tongues. How was your week? They start speaking in tongues. What has God spoken to you? It was a sign of Paul is saying malice. It is being immature in terms of understanding. It was braggadocio. Like, you know me, the places I've been with God, you cannot understand. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Hallelujah. So that is what Paul was talking about. Number two, when people are praying in tongues, the way we usually pray in tongues, and an unbeliever comes, or an unlearned person comes and, and they say, you guys, you guys are mad. You guys are insane. So a person that does not understand what tongues are, we said number one, they are being judged. Okay? Number two, it is either the church that is not in order as pertaining the prophetic interpretation of tongues. In verse 24 says, if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. In terms of prophesying, remember the distinction between prayer and prophecy. That if truly we are supposed to prophesy in tongues, let somebody interpret for a newcomer to understand so that they can be convinced and so that they can be judged. If an unbeliever says that, you guys are mad. All of you are praying in tongues. Is it the fault of the people that are praying in tongues or the fault of the unlearned? My question, if all of us are speaking in tongues here and praying in tongues, speaking mysteries to God, and a new believer comes in and says, you guys are mad. You guys are insane. Of course, this verse is talking about the prophesying part, but I'm talking about the praying part. Is it our fault or it, is it the fault of the non-believer? Because it is a judgment to them. Hallelujah. The problem comes in only if all of us are prophesying in tongues and there is no interpretation. Are we together? The Spirit can fall on us. Oh, let's just continue because that point is coming. It's coming. So in verse 24 and verse 25, the Bible says that the interpretation of prophetic tongues helps non-believers to be converted, to be convicted, to be persuaded. So if they are not interpreted, there are some people who will never come to the Lord. But if they are interpreted, God begins to judge their hearts. God begins to convict them. The Bible says they fall down on their faces and they worship and they report that God is truly in us. Verse 26, the Bible says, I've even left my notes, so let's just finish because of time. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. So he was correcting the culture of people speaking in tongues without interpretation. And he was saying, rather come with something that people can understand. In verse 27, the Bible says, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two 
or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. So if we are 50 of us in this room, the opportunity for people to prophesy in tongues can only be given to two or three. Even if 50 of us want to prophesy in tongues, the order that Paul said, let two or three come. Hallelujah. And then let one interpret. So if three people have come here and they're saying, this is what the Lord is saying. I don't have the interpretation. I hope somebody can interpret. And then they call the interpreter. So they begin to speak or prophesy or bless in tongues. And then one, an interpreter comes and says it. An interpreter comes and says it. An interpreter comes and says it. Hallelujah. So that we don't have 50 people speaking in tongues and 50 people interpreting. It was for the purposes of order. Hallelujah. Can you go later on and say, this is what I wanted to say to the church leadership, but only three people were picked today? Yes, because the voice of God cannot be muzzled. If God spoke, he spoke. It was just for the purposes of order. Can you write to the leadership and say, I was not among those that were chosen, but I spoke in these tongues. Can I send a recording for the interpreter? To interpret, yes. Hallelujah. And some of you, you speak in tongues, and you know these ones are not normal. I've moved from prayer to prophecy, or I've moved from prayer to utterance, blessing. And you feel like somebody needs to interpret. Call the person that you know has the grace of interpretation as you pray for you to interpret it yourself. Hallelujah. Verse 28, and this is the most controversial or the most misunderstood verse. It says, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. People end at let him keep silence in church, full stop. But the verse continues to say, let him speak to himself and to God. Hallelujah. So, if truly, to me, it's not to interpret tongues. Hapa, mtu hapa, mungu anamungelesha. And nobody says, ah, today, there's no interpreter. We do not muzzle the prophecy or the tongues. We just tell this person, sit somewhere or go to a corner somewhere, but continue speaking to yourself and to God. Speaking to yourself is not speaking in, in, it's not the literal speaking to yourself because that is insanity. Ushayetu want to speak in tongues na watu mtukone anajiongelesha kwa nini? Hapana, hatujiongeleshi. Speaking to himself and to God is to edify himself through the speaking of tongues. So you are benefiting from your tongues because you are praying to God. Hallelujah. Paul did not say, let him be silent and never speak again in tongues. Or let him be silent and only speak in English to himself. Speaking in English to yourself is insanity, but speaking in English to God is tongues. It is a prayer language. Hallelujah. The Bible says, let the prophet speak, verse 29, two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to, an, uh, to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. So this is the prophetic manifestation. So if somebody has a prophecy, they should come, Two or three. Ten of us could have, but for the sake of order, it's only two or three. And then one judges. A prophecy cannot just be given without it being judged. It has to be discerned. That's the leadership of the church that will determine 
whether that prophecy is accurate or not. Because somebody can just say God is speaking to me and they prophesy falsely. So if there's no one to judge a prophecy, then let the person sit in silence and speak to himself and to God. Hallelujah. Lastly, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So the spirit of the prophet being subject to the prophet is that you can control your tongues or you can control yourself when you're speaking in tongues or when you're prophesying. Hallelujah. So if, if we are to speak it to the congregation, no matter how urgent we feel it is, we must follow the protocol. Hallelujah. If the pastor has said, so-and-so is the first one to say it, then followed by so-and-so, then followed by so-and-so, you cannot say mine is so hot. Hallelujah. So it is subject. That is why you can start praying in tongues and you, and you can stop. Hallelujah. Na zamba amka kidogo utaangukiwa na your name. Na unaamka useme ah. Vile roho amenishika. You are quenching the spirit. Hallelujah. Wezi enda kwa boss wako amekuambia my friend your work is not okay. You need to improve. Unaanza hapo tanks. Let me tell you my God. Akikunyamazisha unasema no, stop silencing your quenching the spirit. You can stop. Tell your neighbor you can stop. For the sake of order and protocol that God demands so that there's no confusion. He's not the author of confusion. Sometimes we want to pray and dad says, amen, amen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are like God. Thank God he says if you want to continue, you can continue, which is good. But for the purposes of the authority that God has placed upon you, you can subdue your spirit if there's a greater cause for the congregation. Hallelujah. So I think we will end there. I wanted to teach about this because in the move of the spirit, when the spirit comes to baptize us, the first and foremost sign is the speaking in tongues. And somebody asked, should all of us speak in tongues? Is it a must for all of us to speak in tongues? If you read Ephesians, the Bible says for some he gave tongues, for some he, gives, he gave the gift of power, working of miracles, for some he gave apostles, for some he gave prophets. And he says, but covet the best gift. Hallelujah. So a Christian who is not coveting the gift of intimacy, of praying mysteries, the will of God, beyond us. Heruseme, I'm not speaking now, but I'm coveting it. Hallelujah. Baptism of the Spirit is not without an, an overflow. That's what Dad was teaching. You cannot say, I know I have the Holy Spirit. Is there evidence? No. Is there anything we can use to say that you have been filled with the Holy Ghost? No, it is in my heart. The Holy Spirit is in my heart. No. If it is an overflow, there has to be evidence. We have to see it. Hallelujah. And one of the initial in the early church, that was like the basic minimum, the bare minimum evidence for the baptism of the Holy Spirit because God is in the overflow. 
God is not in a small measure. God is in the overflowing measure. Hallelujah. So if there's an overflow, sound must come. If there's an overflow, tongues of intimacy, prayer language that brings us in a journey with him that is distinguished from another person. It must come. Hallelujah. It must come. It must come. So let's be on our feet and just thank God for his word. If you desire the gift of tongues, this is the time for that evidence to come. There are also other gifts in the, of the Holy Spirit. If you desire working of miracles, healing, faith, love, this is the time to receive that gift in the name of Jesus Christ. Just go before the Lord. Speak mysteries to him. Ask him in understanding the things that you desire. That are an evidence that you have been filled with the spirit. It can't just be tongues only. Let it also be an interpretation of tongues. Let it also be wisdom. Let it also be knowledge. I mean, we need evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We cannot witness without evidence. We cannot evangelize without evidence. We have been baptized by water. Now let us be baptized with the Spirit. The Bible says that the aprons of Peter used to heal the sick. The shadow used to heal the sick. Nobody could doubt that they had been baptized with the Holy Spirit. What do you have to show the world about the baptism that you received? About the outpouring of the Spirit? About the life in the Spirit? The discerning of Spirit is available for us. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, let us enjoy the full package of baptism. We cannot just enjoy a small portion of it. There's so much in God that we can walk in. There's so much in God that we can walk in for the purposes of ministry, for the purposes of preaching the gospel, for the purposes of bringing people to the kingdom. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Spirit. 